Good evening, everybody. Could have your attention. We'll get started this evening. My name is Sam Brownback. I'm a U.S. Senator out of Kansas. Uh, welcome to the debt capital of the world, Washington, D.C., unfortunately. Uh, but you guys are here with new ideas and ways to do things better, and I like that. Uh, we clearly need that. On the way driving here from Capitol Hill, I went by a protest group, and I was commenting to the office, said, oh, I'd like to see what's pro who's protesting. Well, it was D.C. teachers because things aren't going so well in the educational system in the District of Columbia. So I think you're here at a propitious time to be able to talk about education, reform, what we need to be able to do to be able to maximize the use of our dollars to get the most education bang for our buck. Uh, and you guys are about it. I'm, I've met the panel members. I'm excited about hearing what they have to say. I think you're going to have a great, uh, great dinner this evening. I'm going to give a quick introduction for each of them. Uh, then I am off and out of your way. I think this is a, pardon me, I think this is kind of a cruel and unusual punishment that you do a panel before you get to eat. Uh, but it's, it's kind of the way Washington works because they figure everybody leaves once the food gets on the table. So. Uh, Prime Minister, I think that's particularly bad. I, uh, it seems to me you always ought to, you shouldn't be in the way between a person and their food. is a bad place to be between them. But we have a great panel tonight. Uh, Julia Gilliard is the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. Delighted to have her here. She also serves as Minister for Employment. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. They just did a stimulus the right way. It was deficit neutral, and they were just able to raise their interest rates because they're running their country uh, on an economically balanced basis. God bless you for showing a good example uh, on how to do it. Uh, Australia will release the country's first school-by-school -school report this January. She's going to be working on that, cards on student performance and reading and math. And uh, this is going to be uh, this is uh, one area she's working in, and I look forward to her talking about it. We also have here, and I'm going to butcher the name, I apologize ahead of time, I'm from Kansas, uh, Peye Emelson. Good. Well, let's give him a round of applause, and, uh, and, and me too for pronouncing it right. Uh, it's an education entrepreneur who founded the Knowledge Schools in Sweden. Now, I don't associate uh, sort of an entrepreneurial situation with Sweden. But you're going to hear about a great entrepreneurial setting in the schools that they have. The Swedish name for his school, I can't get, but I can pronounce it, Kunskapskolan Schools. The schools have flourished since the country adopted universal vouchers and what they call pupil passports more than a decade ago. Uh, I look forward to their uh, comments. Uh, Governor Bush traveled there uh, and had a great uh, educational discussion and tour. James Tooley is a professor and author whose groundbreaking research about private education in the slums of India and China and Africa has earned him international acclaim. His recent book, The Beautiful Tree, I don't know if he's got one here on stage, is an inspiring story of what parents in the poorest communities on earth are doing to provide a quality education for their children. Uh, I've been in some of these places where the school building is a tree, it's under a tree. Uh, and I'm just, I'm looking forward to your comments. Please welcome him to the stage as well. And then, of course, you already know your host, uh, Governor Jeb Bush. It's the reason we're all here tonight. He's got a passion for education, uh, a zeal for it, and a zeal for ideas. Uh, and to me, running for governor in Kansas in 2010, what I love about people like Jeb Bush is they run on ideas. And our party and the country needs us running on ideas, not on personalities. Not to say you've got a personality deficit, or I do either. That's not what I'm saying at, at all. But we do best when we run on ideas, and the country works best when you run on ideas. And you lay them out there, and you say, this is what I want to do. And that's what he did. That's what he did on education. That's what he got done. And that's the way to do it, I think, in governance. So I'm looking forward to hearing from him. And please welcome him as your moderator tonight. Jeff, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brownback is a man of unbelievable uh, good judgment. He's leaving the United States Senate, which is supposed to be the, they claim at least, the world's most uh, prestigious club to become, to get the best job in the world, which is to be a United States governor of one of the 50 states. So good luck on that. So 
we're going to have uh, an hour-long conversation, and I thought it would be best to ask each one of our participants that have come far and wide to talk about what they're doing, uh, to spend five to seven minutes about, about the, um, the thing that uh, they're passionate about and what, they, what they've been up to, and then we'll have a conversation and open it up for questions. But before I do that, I've learned something in politics that, uh, um, that's important. The, co the, the convergence of policy and politics, right, Deputy Prime Minister, is important. You can't just have great ideas. You have to figure out creative strategies to implement them. And one of those strategies I've always found is to get people from really far off places that are really smart to come and validate the things that we know we need to do. <laughs> Somehow that always works, doesn't it? When you're, if you're in your own place and you say something, everybody goes, well, there's got to be a motive. You know, there's got <laughs> but if, you come, if, if someone comes and says the exact same thing and validates what you believe, it just has a power to it. I, it. It's a smart thing to do. So I would encourage all of you, when you go back home, to find the really smart outside expert to come and say what you wanted to say that no one's going to believe you because you're in public life to be able to advance it. So uh, that's my ulterior motive to have these really three talented people to talk about accountability, talk about transparency, talk about choice, uh, and talk about how the myth that some kids can learn and some kids can't uh, is, is, needs to be shattered. That's basically the, the purpose of this. And we're so delighted, Julia, that you're here. And in a very short period of time, you've hit the ground running in Australia. You've taken, you did something that I think is important. You said you were, what you were going to do when you ran. And, and then to the surprise of, uh, at least in cynical United States, you actually, in Australia, I'm sure they're delighted and expected it. But a lot of times in here, they don't necessarily think political figures uh, will do what they said they were going to do. But you've closed that loop, and I'd like for you to describe what the platform was that you ran on, uh, and then what you did to, um, to implement that, because I think it's very exciting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Governor Bush. And I should start by saying after that introduction that we did play that politician's trick and get someone from the outside to come <laughs> to our country and advocate for school reform. So Joel Klein visited <laughs> Australia and... Uh, he, he was an instant hit, uh, running uh, colour photos on the front pages of our newspapers. Uh, he gave a televised address at the National Press Club, which is where our Prime Minister would go if he was giving the equivalent of your State of the Union address. So um, a very noted figure in Australian education now, and we want him to come back. Uh, but uh, to give you an idea of uh, what we're doing in schools in Australia, I thought I'd just give you a few quick facts about the schooling system because I'm presuming most people don't know that much about Australian education. Uh, we have uh, in Australia government schools which are run by our state governments. We also have a sizeable non-government school system including Catholics and other religious based schools. About 66% of Australian students would go to government schools, the rest would go to the non-government sector. The percentage going to non-government schools increases as you move into the last few years of secondary schooling. Uh, using the terminology government and non-government is actually a little bit confusing because the government provides some money to every school. State governments are the predominant funder of state government schools and we as the national government provide some funding. We as the national government provide funding to non-government schools. It is weighted for the socio-economic status of the uh, school, it, the students in that school. Uh, so lower socio-economic status schools get more, but every school gets some government funding. I think that's important to understand. Uh, when we're looking at the Australian education system, uh, parents do have choice. Uh, in most states, they can make a decision about what government school they want their children to go to or they can choose to pay some level of private fee and send their child to a non-government school. We do have many low-fee schools, so it can be affordable for uh, working-class families to have their children go to non-government schools. Uh, so what's wrong with the system? Well, a few things are wrong with it. Our international test results show that generally we have a good education system. 
uh, but we have underachievement strictly correlated with being from a poor background. So we are failing disadvantaged kids. We are particularly failing our Indigenous children, our, our children who come from Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander backgrounds, where the achievement gap is considerable between those students and Australian students generally. Our retention rates to Year 12 have been at around 75 per cent and have stubbornly stayed there, so we are not getting enough students through the whole journey of secondary education or attaining an equivalent qualification. Uh, to give you an idea just about the political backdrop for reform, uh, we are a newly elected Labor government. We were elected in November 2007. We were elected to promising to deliver an education revolution. We said education would be front and centre of what this government did. Uh, being a Labor government, we are the Democrat equivalent in your politics. Uh, in order to make a change in education, we need to deal with state governments. We have six states and two territories. Currently, each of them has Labor governments, Democrat governments, apart from the state of Western Australia, which has a Liberal government, which confusingly in our politics is the equivalent of being a Republican. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I can explain that to people individually later, I think, but I, I know that uh, that could be viewed as an insult for some in the room. So it's a little, I, little L liberal. <laughs> it's, um, well, it's big L liberal party and um, uh, it's the, the conservative party in our politics. Um, so against that backdrop, now I can tell you're all confused, uh, we wanted to implement a wholesale school reform, what we called and wanted to be an education revolution. So there are five interlocking reforms I want to go through really quickly. One is transparency, which will go live on a website next January. Uh, anyone in Australia will be able to look at a school, will be able to see uh, who's in the school, the socioeconomic status of the kids in the school, the number of Indigenous kids. They'll be able to see the numbers of teaching staff and non-teaching staff, the attendance record. They will be able to see the results in national tests. We have national tests and we've had them for two years. They'll be able to see the 2008 and 2009 national test results. Uh, powerfully, they will be able to compare that not only to schools in their local vicinity for the purpose of making a choice about schooling, but they will be able to compare it with like schools around the nation. And by like, we mean schools that serve similar student populations. So if you see a school with a similar student cohort doing much better, there is obviously best practice to be shared. If you see schools doing much worse, then they are underperforming and we can intervene to lift their performance to where other schools are getting to. We will later build into the system transparency about school resources so people will know how much is being expended on the teaching task. That's a way of keeping us, the politicians, honest because if it is transparent that extra resources make a difference to educational outcomes, then that will be a political debate about what the next thing that politicians should do for schooling should be. Uh, when you've identified underperformance, that's one thing, but then you've got to do something to make a difference to it. The second part of our reforms is a focus on quality teaching. And here we've unashamedly borrowed from America. We've got a Teach for Australia a body that's come into being. Uh, we even pinched the name with just one word change. Um, and uh, we've got the first 60 of those high-performing graduates going into their intensive preparation for school in our summer, which will be your winter, and they will start at the start of the next school year in February. Uh, we are also using that money to make a difference to pay outcomes for teachers and already in one state of Australia, it's only small, it's 100 teachers, but we have a program that is paying 100 highly accomplished teachers more to go and teach in disadvantaged schools and we obviously want to spread that through the system through our uh, national quality arrangements. We've also got to focus on school leadership because we understand how much of a difference school leadership makes. Uh, this also intersects with a new $1.5 billion allocation to put money into disadvantaged schools, so having identified them, 
extra resources will be there for whole school improvement plans for which people will be held accountable. And this interlocks with a new half a billion dollars uh, for literacy and numeracy to drive improvement right across the system, but particularly in disadvantaged schools. So the piece all plays out together because we want to lift standards in every school, but we particularly want to lift standards in those schools that have fallen the furthest behind. Uh, the, the additional piece of that puzzle is our new national curriculum, and I know that there is a debate about these things in America. Our curriculum currently is uh, generated by state governments and by non-government schools. We have agreement uh, that everyone will implement a new national curricula in four subjects, the core subjects of maths, English, science and history from 2011 on. The national curriculum is in generation now and will be finished in the middle of next year. And then we will move to national curriculum for the remainder of the subjects. So that's our interlock sense of reform there. I need to be very clear, every reform we are making applies to both government and non-government schools. We are able to enforce that, partly through hopefully the power of our ad advocacy, but also because money talks. Uh, and we as a national government make four yearly agreements with state governments about education funding and we've made these things a condition of our national education agreement and the new national partnerships through which new resources will flow. We've also made these things a condition of the way in which we fund non-government schools. So transparency, teacher quality, more money for disadvantaged schools, literacy and numeracy, the national curriculum, will apply in every school around the country. Um, I'll conclude by saying on top of that, as part of our stimulus response to the global recession, we are engaging in the biggest school modernisation program our nation's ever seen. We're spending more than 1% of GDP in 18 months on school buildings. That's a very big thing to do, uh, and it's going to make a very big difference to our capital stock in schools. Uh, there is no bigger piece of economic stimulus in our nation than our focus on modernising school buildings. And it joins with capital programs we already had to build trade training centres in secondary schools and also to give a one-to-one -one student to computer ratio in upper secondary schools so that they can participate in what, what we're calling the digital education revolution. We are guided by a philosophy that says we can do better by every child, we can certainly do better for those kids who need it the most. Uh, quickly, the, the watchwords I'd say for policy reform, uh, choice is important, but choice doesn't mean much without transparency. Choice without transparency is actually guessing, and we want to end, end the guessing, we want to have the transparency. Uh, teacher quality makes the biggest difference and we need to invest in that, and we are. National curriculum, um, national testing can make a big difference to lifting standards, and we are engaged in those things we think they're really important. And whilst great teachers can get great educational outcomes sitting under a tree, one way, way a nation can say we value students, teachers, parents, people who are engaged in education, is by saying to them, we want you to have good facilities and the nation's money is going to go on that. And that's the message we've tried to send through our economic stimulus to every school in the country. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Madam Deputy Prime Minister, with a couple of tweaks, that to me is, sounds like a pretty darn good agenda for a governor candidate uh, from any state in the country because it, <laughs> it, uh, it is right on target. And um, what I love are people that run for office saying what they're going to do, even if it may be controversial, even if it may take core constituencies that are part of your electoral base and give them concern, uh, run on it, have the courage to run on your convictions, and then better yet, implement it. So congratulations on that, and I know you'll continue to do a fantastic job. So now we're going to move to Beye, who i got to tell you the story. I'm, so I'm in Stockholm, Sweden, on business, and I get told I'm going to go see a, a, uh, a, an interesting school owned by uh, a guy with some investors that has 30 or how many, 35 others, uh, schools more or less, 
in one of the tougher parts of Stockholm. Now, the tougher parts of Stockholm, Joel, ain't like tougher parts of New York City or Miami. It's, <laughs> I, my first reaction was, this, this ain't too tough. But it's, <laughs> but it's Sweden, so you know, you gotta, they're, they're, they've got a different system. <laughs> so we go to the school, and one of the first kids I meet is a six foot three, six foot four, 15 year old or 14 year old. I didn't know how, how old he was, but he was a young guy, because this is a middle school from Somalia wearing a Che Guevara t-shirt. I don't like Che Guevara, just to be, <laughs> let, the record, let the record know that I got a problem with Che and his policies, but um, young people seem to love the guy or love his picture or whatever. So I'm thinking, this could be, a, we, could, we, we could be in for a confrontation. The exact opposite happened. This kid is alive, excited about learning, newly arrived to Sweden. Stockholm is one of the places where um, the maybe one of the first European cities that will be a majority immigrant population uh, in, in all of Europe. Uh, and this kid is speaking fluent English. I'm assuming that what he was speaking when he wasn't speaking English was uh, fluent Swedish. And, and I, I'm sure he's trilingual from his native country of Somalia. So, and then he's learning a, th a third language at the school. And this, it was so inspirational to see this, this school didn't have all the, a lot of the bells and whistles that fancy pants schools have in our country, but the, the focus on pushing kids at their own pace and their own way was spectacular. And I, I invited Peggy to come uh, introduce him to Joel because Joel does a lot of this innovation in New York, said you've got to set up your next school outside of, of Sweden in the United States. And if it's not in New York City, I hope it's in Florida. But we welcome you, and I'd love to get a sense of what got you as a businessman involved in this, and um, and, and also t tell a little bit about what the what the when the law changed yeah. to allow this to happen. Thank you, Governor. Uh, let me start with uh, the change that made it possible, because you know, Sweden had a very monolithic system. Less than one percent of students went to private schools. Wow. And uh, everyone was obliged to go the first nine years in the same classroom, basically. And you were not allowed to uh, uh, give additional uh, resources to someone that was uh, good, because it was the basic feeling in very egalitarian Sweden that everyone was the same. <clears throat> so we started from a political point of view. I also got a a background in the Conservatives. I was on, on the board of Conservative Party in the, in the 80s. And uh, we started to drive the idea that maybe you should have the right to choose school. Maybe it's not only something for the politicians. And at that time, Sweden, after 1968, came out of a period where we were very much to the left. And the idea with schools were not knowledge, but to develop into good citizens, basically. So step by step, you got the feeling in Sweden that the educational system was not good enough. And people started a few, a few schools by themselves, which they were not basically allowed to do. But we got a debate, and if you do that by yourself, and you know, taxes in Sweden are fairly high. <laughs> uh, We're trying so to catch say, up why, with you. Why should you have to pay twice? Uh, so if you go to another school, maybe you should get some money from the municipalities. And we managed to get some of them to give money. And then uh, we had some very interesting uh, debates in rural areas where, where schools were closed and parents wanted to take over schools. And everything got into momentum when we got the new government, 91, that we actually got the voucher, 92. And egalitarian Sweden then said that schools that want that voucher goes to the kid or the parents and can be applied to independent as well as state schools. So everyone is in the same system. We suddenly move the decision making directly to the students and their parents. And when the Social Democrats got back in power in 1905, they looked at this and said, well, the Conservatives only gave 85%. That is not fair. Let's increase it to 100%. <laughs> but with one condition, you are not allowed to charge anything extra. 
not a dollar extra. You live on exactly the same amount. And you cannot pick students. It's first come, first serve. You can never test them. It's first come, first serve. So we have built a egalitarian financing to taxes and competition with independent schools and public schools. And today uh, we have about over 10% goes to the independent schools. In some areas it's over 20%. And step by step, study after study has shown that it has, it's not only better results in independent schools, because there are some creative new ideas, uh, but it has also made the public schools better because it's led to competition. Because if the public school, if they don't perform, the students say, ah, I go to another school instead. And that is the beauty of the system which we now call the, the new Swedish model. Uh, and of course there was debate in the beginning, should we be able to do this? Even among the conservatives said, but pay, are you going to start a school for profit? Are you crazy? And yeah, I said, I think I do that. Now it's basically accepted that you, you can do it. It's the, and we are getting prouder and prouder in Sweden of that model. So get back to the knowledge school then. Of course it can, it came back from my own experience in school. It normally does that way. But I was able to bring in some very bright teachers. And he said, well, you shouldn't be there 45 minutes and then uh, take a break and 45 minutes. So let's take the whole curriculum for a three-year period and put it in 37 different steps. And uh, then we put all the curriculum of 50,000 web pages. And we build a school without traditional classrooms because you, you, you learn when you speak or when you listen or you write, everyone is different. And regardless if you are 20, 25, 30, or 40, which when I was at school, a teacher loses the best and the worst. It's always like that. So we test the students when they come in. How much do you know? And they put their goals for the next semester and for the whole period. And we have converted the teachers to more into coaches. So we take out 30 hours a week they spend with our students. In average in Swedish schools it's less than 20. And every week they sit down 15 minutes with everyone and say, okay, what have you done this week? What are you going to do next week? How has that changed your goals? And honestly, not many of you sit down 15 minutes a week with your children and discuss their goals, okay? Uh, so that has led to, uh, you. they are always accountable and they get their own personal uh, lessons. Uh, sometimes you have a lecture with 50 people, sometimes you see two persons and, and work. And then we built the two chain of 33 schools at present, the headmaster has a one goal, to make sure that the kids learn as much as possible. And one restriction, only use $95 out of every 100 because we need to preserve some money for investments. And at present now with 750 teachers uh, and 10,000 students, uh, we had in the last rating the merit rating in Sweden, we had 236, and, and the average is 206. Uh, it's much better, straight through. And then, it's first come, first serve. So we cannot pick them. So that way of having a personalized education has then attracted quite some attention. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the voucher, but it has to do with the fact that we got the opportunity to get in with new ideas and turn things upside down. So I have signed an agreement with Lord Adonis, who was then Secretary of Schools in, in the Academies in London. So we are going to open two academies in Richmond, financed by the British government in September. And we are very much looking forward to see which American state will be the first one. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much.
I was I was almost disappointed uh, that you said you were going to London, and and but that last last little part of the end of that sentence warmed my heart. So I'm sure you may have actually some people uh, calling you up. Uh, it is a spectacular place to learn. I can promise you that. And the expectations are significantly higher than the classrooms I've seen, and the results are, are great. So thank you again for for coming. Bayou, by the way, is uh, went from Stockholm to Japan to. Washington, D.C., and so I don't think you have jet lag when you just never stop, but <laughs> pretty soon it's going to hit you, so we hope we can get through this, uh, through this dinner. Dr. Tooley, thank you so much for coming. He has written a spectacular book called uh, The Beautiful Tree. He's a professor at Newcastle University, um, a big thinker, and a, unlike some of the professorial types that I know, he's actually acting on his, his big thoughts, and has been studying how it is to be able to deliver education to places that historically have not touched education, uh, and he has an unbelievable story. I encourage you guys to, to buy the book. Don't, don't get it for free, um, uh, because it is a, it's an inspirational book about um, the human spirit, and it's also an inspirational book about how, if we stay focused on assuring that children learn that that they'll do it, that uh, there's all sorts of ways to organize ourselves around kids, irrespective of where they come from, for them to gain the power of knowledge. So, Jim, th James, thank you so much for coming. It's a delight to have you here. Th thank you very much indeed. And uh, incidentally, Governor, I wasn't at all offended when I saw the, the conference program here with, um, you probably see it, see it yourself, the cover there with the Swedish flag next to the American flag, the Australian flag slightly tucked down under and the Union Jack nowhere to be seen, the British flag. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm A relieved. small oversight. Uh, um, we're, we're, we're a mature nation, you know. We, uh, we don't need flags, and the uh, that little uh, little tea affair in Boston is quite forgotten. You know. um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Ten, ten years ago, ten years ago, I was a very, very dissatisfied man. I'd become an expert in private education. And I was doing some work for the International Finance Corporation, which is the private finance arm of the World Bank. And um, so I've become an expert on private education, but it was all about the elites, the upper middle classes, the upper classes. And that wasn't what I thought my life should be about. Maybe it was my Christian background, Matthew 25, 40, you know, what did you do for the least of my brothers and sisters? But anyway, on one of these missions, the World Bank sends you on missions, on one of these missions I, I was sent to India. Uh, they flew me Concord from New York to London um, on this mission. Mike Tyson was on the flight going for his, <laughs> his, uh, he, going for his, last, his, last, his last fight, I think, in Scotland. Anyway, so I, I went to India, as I say, a little bit dissatisfied. And so I thought, well, what are the poor doing? What are the poorest of the poor doing here? So on a day off, I took an auto rickshaw, one of those three-wheelers in India, down to... The Charminar, this triumphal arch in the center of Hyderabad in South Central India. Because I'd read in my rough guide to India, that was where the slums, the city, were, were behind, were behind the Charminar. And I went walking there. And I had a, had a hunch about what I would find down one alleyway, then another. And then, sure enough, there was a private school. I went in and met the proprietor. He was friendly, he was welcoming me, he spoke a bit of English. He said, Yeah, we. Ch they charged about 50 rupees a month, which is equivalent of about one US dollar per month. And he, he, he had half girls, half boys there. He was a Muslim proprietor, and he showed me a bit of the school. And then I went around another corner. There was another private school, and then another. And soon, in about 10 days, I, I, I visited about 50 of these low-cost private schools and heard about 500 others of these low-cost private schools in the slums of India. And for me, it was an incredible revelation. I, a revelation on all sorts of levels. One was, um, I, I met this guy called Wajit, who was, again, a Muslim chap who was serving the less blessed people in his community, he said. Um, and he told me about the government inspectors who came five times a year. And I thought, hmm, that shows some degree of dedication from these, these government inspectors. And, until he, he took me in his confidence one day and said, well, actually, it's not quite like that. They, they come and... Uh, we, they come to my office only, they don't go to the classroom, we, we slip them the envelope and they go away satisfied. And he, he, t he told me this memorable phrase, which I, which I always remember. He said, sometimes, James, sometimes government is the obstacle of the people. 
Sometimes government is the obstacle of the people. And that's what he was experiencing as a proprietor of a low-cost private school in the slums of India that government was getting in his way in his service and his business to the people. So I, I, I came back to Washington, D.C., really excited about this discovery and telling everyone I, I met in the World Bank, and they said, no, 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 you, you've met, you, you've seen something unremarkable. It's not part of education for all. It's not part of anything that can serve the poor. These are businessmen ripping off the poor. I thought, businessmen ripping off the poor? I'd seen them in their schools, but then on weekends, they were holding sports fairs and science fairs in their spare time into, sports competi in, into school competitions. I thought, this is something remarkable, but no one would believe me back here. And so I thought, I've got to do research. And I got a, a wonderful grant from the John Templeton Foundation in wow. Philadelphia. And uh, I was able to do a study in, in five countries, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, a few places in India, and rural China. And the headline figures, and I'll conclude with this, the headline figures were the same in all the urban and peri-urban areas. In the slums and the shanty towns of these cities and in, in these countries I described, the majority of school children were going to these low-cost private schools. The majority, 65 to 75% of school children were in these low-cost private schools charging maybe two, three, four, five US dollars equivalent per month. We tested 24,000 children across these in maths, English, and one other subject, Kiswahili in Kenya, Urdu in Hyderabad, Hindi in Delhi, and we found these low-cost private schools funded in the great majority, without any subsidy from anyone, funded by parental fees, they were outperforming the government schools, and they're outperforming them at a fraction of the cost. So this, to me, was an incredible celebration. Of course, a celebration. I've been, for the last decade, I've been celebrating what I've been finding. I've been writing this book and other articles, and uh, I, I'm, I want to tell you more, but I'm, I'm anxious that... Uh, well, well, I'd, I'd like hand to, over to you again. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, if you're not inspired by that, then you don't have a heart. <laughs> so the, the three stories create a, a mosaic, I think, of, uh, of what could be in, in, in our country and other places. Um, and for those that think, when you hear, when you hear someone come and tell you it can't be done, just remember this evening, because uh, it can be done. It can be done in all sorts of different ways. James, I wanted to ask you a question because I've, I've been studying the idea of how innovation and technology transfer. Historically, the traditional thinking is it comes, it comes from the developed world to the emerging world. Mm. But there's a lot of new thinking now that, in fact, um, a lot of spectacular innovation is taking place in the emerging world. And the question is, can it be transferred to the staid developed world that has kind of had its, have its, has its blood clocked, you know, it's, it's not, the heart isn't beating at the same pace where atrophy is kind of set in. Do you think it's possible to take the innovations in education and other places that are being applied in all sorts of wondrous places like you just described and bring them to the UK or Sweden or Australia or the United States? Yes, I mean, you and I remember the NBC program in 1980, I think it was, if Japan can why can't we? It's about the motor industry. And I, I think a similar story should be told now. If India can, why can't we? Um, the, 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 innovate, the, the schools I'm talking about are very poor, okay? And the, I mean, they're not just under trees. But so the innovations that are taking place there are taking place slowly. And they won't necessarily be um, the sort of things you want to take on now. But across India and China, you've got a flourishing private sector You've got chains of private schools of, you know, a small chain might be 60 or 70 uh, schools. You've got chains of 100, 200 private schools who, who are innovating. And I, I can see just as now you've got um, India is being invaded by McDonald's and Starbucks and um, uh, subways. That's the first phase of, phase of globalization that you see in India. Maybe the second phase will be some of these chains of private schools from India and China coming on, taking on, taking on your situation here. And uh, I, I'm very excited by that. I don't, uh, this arms race, I think it's, a, it's not a race one can lose. I think we can all gain from it. Exactly. I'm so excited that the, the Swedish model, as we call it, the Swedish model is coming to London soon. 
I'm so excited that uh, these innovations, we live in a global world and education can be at the forefront of this next wave of globalization. Definitely. Hey, your, your school, I was very impressed with the fact that the newly arrived uh, into Stockholm were treated exactly the same. There wasn't like a, well, we're going to have a different level of expectation for a kid from Somalia or a kid from uh, Iraq where there's a huge refugee and immigrant population in Sweden. Uh, they had the same, everybody in your school at least, I haven't been to the other schools, but your school had the same expectation for every child irrespective of where they came from and their background. Um, you have enough data now, I assume, to to disprove the notion that every child can learn if you have loftier and the same expectation. Has it been disproven or has it been validated? It's been validated and uh, that was very important part of the idea from the beginning. A, we did not enter into areas with rich people. We, we picked areas uh, which were more problematic. And obviously I wanted to prove that we could bring better education to do. So I, I'm more concerned with a 95% market that is there. I don't care that much about the 5% on the top. They, they will always succeed. Uh, and the individual model, uh, that means that you, you really look into each student when they start and give their personal plan uh, makes an enormous difference. Uh, everyone is seen as a human being in the system. So every, every child in your school has an individual education plan and there's an expectation to complete all these modules. Are your standards higher than the Swedish standards or those? No, we, we actually, we are following the national curriculum. It's we pretty are strong authorized by, by doing that, but we are on average doing better. Some of our schools are among the best in Sweden. Some are in tougher situation. You know, we, you, when you have 67, 70% new Swedes, there are some tough areas. Uh, also there. They look pretty nice. I, I didn't thank you that far. <laughs> but it's the, but the, the, the major thing is that they are doing better than the other schools. You know, when we, we try to, we measure all the time. We, we measure what parents think, what teachers think, what students think, and we measure the result for each teacher in that group of 20 to see how much they have been able to to make sure that the kids learn more. Uh, and we, we see that, of course, very clear socioeconomic differences. So we try to, to push in Sweden to get that more of that into measure when we have our national tests. Julia, I, I did a little background on you. Uh-oh. And um, <laughs> uh, you come from the labor movement. You have strong political support in your political career from the union movement, and yet you, what you described, if that was described as a platform for a campaign, or worse yet, uh, was described as a uh, agenda for implementation in the United States, there would be a lot of squawking from uh, the organized labor unions that would feel threatened by that. So how did you, both in the campaign and then more importantly perhaps in the implementation, how did you communicate a message that lessened people's fears about the kind of changes that you're in the process of implementing? Uh, that's a good question. I should uh, probably uh, describe at this point that um, my job in Australian politics is the equivalent uh, here of being uh, Vice President, Secretary of Education and Secretary of Labor. Uh, my portfolios are education, employment and workplace relations because we deliberately I wanted to put in one portfolio all of the human capital levers, which is a way of explaining that across the uh, broad ambit of what I do, I spend a lot of time having arguments with trade unions in various, uh, various iterations. So to some extent, it's just, just another argument. Uh, but we continue to face uh, pushback from uh, the union that represents the teachers in government schools, the union that represents teachers in non-government schools is less um, aggressive about these questions. And uh, you know, the high point of that um, has been that there is some suggestion uh, that the uh, government uh, teachers union will say that they should not 
administer the national tests in 2010 because it interlinks with our transparency agenda. That, of course, would be a big problem for us because we only have three-year election terms and so we are up for re-election in 2010. So they obviously know that. Um, now, whether or not that will happen, um, I, I don't think it will. Uh, she says uh, optimistically, visiting another country, uh, because uh, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I think uh, we have, uh, we've done a persuasion uh, job, a political advocacy job. I mean, all of politics is about ideas and transmitting ideas, which I think means that most teachers are prepared to take to, to give this government a bit of trust because they would see how much uh, we are doing in education and how many new resources we're making available. I mean, over this four-year period, we are doubling uh, the amount of money that uh, the national government puts into school education. So in those circumstances, I think we've got some bona fides on the board. But it's a constant job. Um, Joel uh, participated in a, a program in Australia. It's called SBS Insight, where they get a, um, you know, ordinary Australians come uh, and they have a discussion about a topic. Joel was online from New York. I was there in the crowd, and uh, the teacher advocates in the audience were uh, pushing back hard against the transparency agenda and making the parents, who were instinctively attracted to it, very nervous about it. Uh, and if that conversation plays out spectacularly in our national politics, that will obviously be difficult for us. But I think at this stage we've... Um, We've taken a step forward every day. Uh, we've said what we were going to do. When we've said it, we've then gone on to do it. Uh, to some extent, because we've just been that determined about the march forward, uh, a lot of people who would have caused opposition have seen a freight train coming and thought it was better to jump out of the way. And I think if we continue with that methodical persuasion and implementation, then we will win through. But it's not without risks. It's not without political risks, and we may see some of them crystallise in 2010. So, so one of the lessons is dogged determination, and the second is that big, the bigger the reform, the bigger idea, the longer you're going to have to work to, to make it happen. That's, that's a good lesson for all aspiring policymakers. Hey, you had something to say? Yeah, about trade unions, because or Swedish trade unions are very good. And I think we made a point when we started to have a long discussion with them and managed to get them to accept a new kind of collective agreement, which was they have 40-hour weeks and normal vacation. And the traditional Swedish system, when you have study days, which meant that the teachers were not in school, we got rid of that. So they have the same kind of employment as, as most people have. And they thought it was an experiment, now they like it a lot. And in the last discussion we had, we have agreed that 40% of the increase will be based on uh, how much, how they have succeeded in the classrooms. Uh, which they see as very positive because they would like to increase the differences between the, those that have the lowest pay and the highest pay. Because there's been, of course, a nivellation. Interesting. Let's open it up for questions or comments from the audience. Yes. I don't know where the mics are, but... I have a question and an observation. Question. Nobody in the U.S. Louder. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Thank you. Professor Tooley, in the U.S., we have in the inner city, the, uh, we have faith-based schools. They're generally operated for less dollars and produce good academic results. Okay, so we have that, not the same cost in India, but it's reasonably that. Um, but they're closing at an alarming rate because inner city uh, families cannot afford those, okay? So um, we do have those. Um, but so, Governor Bush, how do we mix politics and policies to get some funding for these schools that cost less and get better academic results? For example, in Washington, D.C., I was part of a conversion of seven Catholic schools to charter schools. Before the conversion, they were educating kids for $8,000 $8, a student. When they got converted to charter schools, they get $14,000 of funding. Significant difference, not necessarily any better academic results. So is there a way that we do this in America? To, well, to there, there's a way to do it in places that 
have more choice, obviously. That's uh, the first step is to open up choices for parents. In Florida, we had a, a system where if schools were failing in the public domain, parents would be given options in a better public school or a private school. That was ruled unconstitutional. The conversion to charters is what's happening across the country. And I think that's the more likely uh, means to protect these schools. But the challenge then is you run into, you may not have these issues in, in your country, probably don't, but we, we have church state issues that, that uh, rear their, their head very quickly. So it's a huge challenge. Um, I would hope uh, that we could find a way to uh, empower the, the Catholic schools in the urban core areas in the Northeast, and then we have a whole slew of new uh, religious schools, evangelical schools um, across the country that are growing, particularly for the immigrant population and in the urban core areas. Uh, the corporate tax scholarship program is probably the most effective way to do that. Uh, we're blessed with, you know, in Florida again, I don't want to toot, toot the, the Florida horn too much, but we've, we've dealt with that issue by giving choices to parents, particularly parents in low-income families, and it, it, it works. But it it requires the determination and fortitude to stick with it and make sure that the implementation is done in an equitable way. James. Can I come back at this observation which is aimed at my comments? I mean, you said parents can't afford these schools anymore and they're, they're closing or something like that. And, you know, people ask me about lessons for, the, for America of my work. And I, I think, obviously, there's the inspiration side. People, the poorest people on this planet in the poorest slums and shanty towns are affording private education. So, you know, we have to question your premise, whether that's true in these um, uh, communities you're talking about, whether there's something else going on. And uh, may maybe, maybe government schools, public schools, have to get so bad that poor parents will refuse to acquiesce in the mediocrity that's in those public schools. And that's when you see this movement you're getting in India and Africa towards these local private schools. There, you know, the, the public schools are atrocious in a way that maybe your worst schools, I don't know whether they're that bad or not, but, uh, you know, we, 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 I took a BBC crew in to, to, the, to the slums um, in, in Lagos, um, in Nigeria, and we went to the public school. We were announced. We were accompanied by the, the administrator for that, that area. And, the very and we were a BBC crew, but the very first classroom we went into the teacher was fast asleep at his desk. <laughs> and uh, oh, Lord. The, BBC kept, the BBC crew was filming this. And the, the children jumped up and welcomed us, you know, singing their welcome to the BBC. Still, the teacher slept. <laughs> oh, and I would not have allowed the BBC to show that film. I would not be talking about it now. If that's not true, in every single time you go into one of these public schools in these poor areas, the teachers are asleep, or they're not there at all, or they're reading the newspaper, or they're drunk, or something like that. Poor parents make that move when the alternative is so bad that they want something better for their children. Another question. There's one back there. Hi, this is a question for uh, Peye. Uh, as far as I understand it, the plan to adopt the Swedish model in Britain includes at least one big difference, which is that the sweet, the, uh, these new schools will not actually be allowed to be run for a profit. And I uh, was just wondering if you could kind of comment on the challenges that uh, schools like these would face in, in the UK and maybe in the US um, yeah. under that condition. Yeah. It's true that in the UK they are not yet introducing the voucher model, but what they are looking at is the personal learning model, so we, we are sponsoring academy, which means that the British government actually will finance the whole adaptation of our system from Swedish into English, uh, which is useful. And then they are building two new schools. Uh, but it's, we can do that as a showcase for a few schools, but in the long run it's not viable. In the long run we will run for profit schools. I'm utterly convinced that for profit schools gives a better, in general, a better educational result. If I look at our 33 schools, the schools that are providing the best financial results are also providing the best result uh, for the students. They learn more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a correlation. There are many studies that, that, that shows that too. So we are expecting that uh, step by step, 
uh, will those traditional, very conservative, if I use that value, is that when you run a school, you shouldn't make money. When you build a school, you can make money, or, but not when you run a school, which is, uh, I believe that the way we operate corporations in an efficient way, we will prove that we will use tax-based money in a more efficient way, getting a better result for it. And then paying income tax when you make a profit. Yes, of course. You know, it's the, as we, we are doing things. We are using, we are becoming more efficient in that way. Uh, but that will be an interesting, the debate is not one everywhere yet. No question about it. Patricia, she's, the, she's, she's been running this, so she gets to ask the last question. Deputy Prime Minister, um, I read your Brookings Institute speech given earlier, and earlier today we had a, a session on tying student data to teachers. And with regards to your transparency issue, we were asked, um, do we have any fears in doing so that teachers will teach to the test more? And I loved your response uh, to, at the Brookings Institute on your transparency initiative and in teaching to the test. Uh, well, I'd, I'd have to say I've uh, copied my response on teaching to the test from Joel Klein, which is a bad thing to admit when you're about to talk about uh, testing, uh, which is, uh, I, I believe the evidence shows, uh, and uh, Joel's evidence certainly shows this, that if you're teaching to the test, if, you, if students are tested and the curriculum uh, takes people through the material that's going to be tested, that is what the teaching task is inherently about. Uh, so you don't want the testing to be about something strange and exotic. You want it to be lined up with the curriculum. And if it's lined up with the curriculum, then it's testing what people should be learning. <laughs> um, and <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds so much better with a beautiful Australian accent, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think Joel's uh, material also shows that if you can improve test results, then across the broad sweep of the educational uh, achievements that we want students to have, you can show that they are going to achieve better across the broad sweep, and that's what we want to achieve as well. Uh, and it, it seems to me that when, when teachers are pushing back on some of these things, it's because they probably know uh, that uh, it's going to focus their teaching time. Uh, but we do want teaching time focused like that. Uh, I've had the opportunity just in Washington uh, to go to a school that's had a remarkable turnaround in student results. And when you do, you can feel the energy. And the other thing you can feel is that they're not wasting a minute of teaching time. Uh, you have uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia walk into the class uh, and the students stay on task until they're invited uh, to welcome the visitor and then as we're walking out of that classroom they're already going back to task. So uh, no, no lost time because they've had this strange person with a funny accent in their classroom. They're, uh, they're there focused on the task and that's what we want to see in schools and that's what we think uh, transparency and accountability can bring. Uh, in Australia, we're not at the stage of, of laying bare publicly individual teacher results for their classrooms, uh, but for us, having school transparency at the school level is a, re is a revolution, and uh, we're going to have it from next January on. Well, let's give a round of applause to our, all of our panellists. Thank you. The my, my good friend and the former commissioner of education in, in uh, Florida uh, used to walk around with a button that John Wynn that said, no excuses. So after you hear this, I think the response is no excuses. We can all do better in our advocacy, uh, and we can encourage our teachers and our students and our parents to do better. And if we do it, great things will happen for our country. And as was said, this is not a question of winning the traditional arms race, you know, where the, it's the Yanks against the Soviets. Uh, it's all of us gain when, when knowledge is lifted up across the world. So thank you all for, uh, for coming. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for traveling nonstop. Let's go eat. Senator. <laughs>
I'd like to introduce Senator Chip Rogers from Georgia, who will lead us in prayer. I apologize. I was supposed to do that. Thank you for being here. We can't forget that. All right, if you will, bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here safely. We thank you for all the amazing ideas that are being brought forth. We ask, uh, most importantly, though, that we remember, uh, as we consider what to do with your most precious gift that you give us, our children, uh, to do your will, Lord. We ask that you bless the hands that prepared this food tonight and keep your hedge of safety over all the servicemen and women around the world that are standing in, in the way of danger for us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.